every few years, every few decades, there is this one product that completely changes everything. A product that's so new, so innovative, that it breaks the boundaries of what we believed was even possible. And one of those products was the MacBook Air. Originally introduced back in 2008, the MacBook Air was the thinnest laptop in the world. It was so thin that Steve Jobs even took it out of an envelope and the audience was amazed. Not only that, but a MacBook Air ended up giving birth to the ultrabook category of laptops that we have now. Those very thin and light and portable laptops that tens of millions of people now own. And aside from being extremely thin, the original MacBook Air was extremely innovative in many other ways as well. It had a multi-touch trackpad that supported the same gestures as the iPhone that was introduced a year prior. Gestures such as pinch to zoom, rotating a photo with two fingers, swiping with three fingers from one home screen to another, and so much more. It removed the disk drive and featured the smallest hard drive ever in a laptop, alongside with the ability to upgrade that to a solid-state drive making the MacBook Air the world's first laptop to come with flash storage. However, the first generation MacBook Air was flawed. The low power Intel Core to Duo processor that was inside of it and the painfully slow 4200 RPM hard drive that was 80 gigabytes in size, alongside the lack of any ports aside from a single USB 2.0 port, a micro DVI port and a 3.5mm headphone jack made it quite a disliked machine at first. Add that to the insanely high price of $1800, that was the starting price point, which back in 2008, that was a lot. Then, two years later and in 2010, Apple released the second generation MacBook Air. This one featured a new tapered design with no more pop-up slots for the ports. It added a second USB port on the other side, it dramatically improved the performance thanks to Intel's brand new Core to Duo processors and Apple now included solid state storage as standard on all models of this new MacBook Air. And then also dropped the price by $500, bringing it down to $1,300. Not only that, but Apple also released a smaller 11-inch model of the Air, which I actually happened to have a few years ago. And this generation, the second generation design, was what Apple was selling for the next eight years, up until 2018. I mean, sure, we did get improvements in terms of the performance and higher capacity storage options, but the design has remained unchanged for those next eight years. And then, in 2018, we got the big third generation. We finally updated the design to bring it in the same line as the MacBook Pros, which got a big update in 2016, and then also the 12-inch MacBook, which was reintroduced in 2015 with that space gray thin design, which sparked this brand new generation of MacBooks. This was really the biggest update that a MacBook Air line has ever received, as we finally got a Retina display, that butterfly keyboard from the MacBook Pros, which ended up being very controversial, and then we also got multiple color options for the first time, such as space gray and gold aside from just silver. In 2019, we got a very small update to the 2018 model with a slightly improved butterfly keyboard mechanism and then a true tone display, but that was mostly it. And now we have the 2020 model, which I've been using for quite a few weeks now and I'm very comfortable giving you guys my full in-depth review on the new MacBook Air. Okay, this was a pretty long intro, so without any further ado, here's my in-depth MacBook Air 2020 review covering the design, the display, the keyboard and trackpad, the camera, microphone, speakers, performance, battery life, and finally, overall, the value. So get all those snacks ready, sit back, relax, and enjoy. While doing so many product reviews to date, many people asked me, what can they do to protect their privacy and their personal data? Wouldn't it be awesome if you could somehow see all the companies that have access to your data? You know, your name, your email, your address, and even your financial and sensitive information. Well, now you can actually do that in just about 30 seconds thanks to Mine, our sponsor for this video. You simply go to saymine.com, you automatically log in using your Google or Microsoft account and soon Yahoo as well, and you log in in literally seconds. Mine will show all websites and apps where your data has been used. And probably my favorite part about it is that you can even reclaim your data with just a press of a button. Once you click reclaim, mine will automatically send an email from your own inbox to request all data to be erased. It's pretty crazy that apps that I haven't used in years still have my data saved. Definitely do try mine out. It's free only for the upcoming months. Mine will be introducing a subscription fee in the future. Right now, you don't have to pay anything. You don't even have to create an account. Just go to the link in the description and start owning your data once again. 
Okay, starting off with the design, the first section out of seven, and I gotta say, design-wise, Apple laptops are definitely my favorites, and the MacBook Air 2020 is no exception. Just like the 2018 model, it is made out of a single piece of aluminum or aluminium, and it comes in three colors, space gray, which is the one that we have here, as well as silver and gold. Now, if you are planning on keeping your MacBook Air for quite a few years, you should be aware that the space gray and the gold, these have coatings on top of silver aluminium, which means that if they scuff, they will reveal that silver underneath it. Therefore, the silver model is the most durable one over time. I've always taken really good care of my MacBooks, and I only have very few minor scuffs on my 2015 12-inch MacBook or my 2017 MacBook Pro. But if you do want to get to the Space Gray model and you do take really good care of it, honestly, you should be fine. Now, the MacBook Air still features the same teardrop-shaped design, where the body gets thinner towards the front and then thicker towards the back, with pretty much no body flex at all. Like, this is honestly one of the sturdiest laptops that I have ever, ever seen. It pretty much is a tank in terms of the build quality, nothing to complain here. But something that definitely shocked me when I took it out of the box was just how heavy it was. I'm coming from a 15-inch 2019 MacBook Pro, and I've also used a 12-inch MacBook for years before that as a secondary MacBook, and the Air was very, very heavy compared to a 12-inch. It is 1.29 kilograms heavy versus 0.92 kilograms of the 12-inch MacBook. So if you're coming from a 12-inch MacBook, the Air will feel extremely heavy. If you're coming from a MacBook Pro 13-inch, you probably won't even be able to tell the weight difference, because the 13-inch MacBook Pro weighs 1.37 kilograms, so they're both extremely similar. So, while the MacBook Air is currently the lightest laptop that Apple sells, as the 12-inch MacBook got discontinued, it is not as light as you would expect it to be, even though it has that Air branding. Also, fun fact, the 2020 MacBook Air is now 40 grams heavier than the 2018 and 2019 models. And then fun fact number two, the 2020 MacBook Air is also thicker this year, coming in at 1.61 centimeters uh, at its thickest point, compared to 1.55 like the 2018 and the 2019 models were. I'll explain why the 2020 Air is thicker and heavier later on in the video. But overall, design-wise, I am extremely impressed. Like, really, my only two concerns here are that number one, I really wish that the air was lighter, and then number two, I also wish that the bezels were thinner. Like comparing the air against something like the Dell XPS 13 2 in 1, and there's a gigantic difference in terms of bezel sizes. The air looks more like a 2016 laptop than a 2021. I really do hope that Apple updates the bezels with the next model because it's already starting to look quite outdated in terms of that. Speaking of the bezels, let's talk about the display. Size wise, we have a 13.3 inch display which is very comparable to a lot of Windows laptops. But we do indeed have a 16 by 10 aspect ratio, meaning that the Air, just like all the other MacBooks, they have a taller display compared to most Windows laptops. And I absolutely love this. Like having more vertical screen real estate is just amazing for reading articles or for when you're writing text. Some Windows laptops like Microsoft Surface laptops or the brand new Dell XPS 13s, they have started adding 16 by 10 aspect ratio displays, but most manufacturers unfortunately haven't. Resolution wise, we have a 2560 by 1600 resolution display, which at 227 ppi, I cannot see any pixels at all on this from a regular viewing distance. It's an incredibly sharp display, text looks like printed paper, so yeah, it's just a joy to look at. On the Windows side, we don't really have laptops with a 2K display, it's usually either 1080p or 4K. 4K is really overkill for laptops. I mean, sure, they're very, very sharp, but then 4K consumes a lot of power, and the sharpness difference between 4K and 2K is almost the same from the normal viewing distance. 1080p does offer the most battery life, but I can easily tell that this display isn't that sharp, and the text is indeed a bit blurry for me on a 1080p 13-inch panel. So 2K is definitely the sweet spot here, and I honestly do hope that more and more manufacturers start adding such displays on the Windows side as well. Color-wise, we have a 93.3 sRGB coverage and a 70.8% DCI-P3 coverage. And while this is actually very good for a laptop and one of the very best displays on any laptop out right now, if you're into video editing or photo editing and you need more a more color accurate display, then you should just get the MacBook Pro instead. MacBook Pros have a 100% sRGB coverage and 98.9% DCI-P3 coverage, meaning that they can display about 30% more colors than the MacBook Air. For example, this DCI-P3 image cannot be displayed at all by the MacBook Air, whereas the Pro can indeed display it. 
Now, I'm not saying that you cannot edit any photos or videos on the MacBook Air at all. You can definitely do that without any issues. But if photo or video editing is what you do on a daily basis as your job, then I would definitely look at something else, something like a MacBook Pro, just because of that even greater or higher and wider color gamut. Brightness-wise, the MacBook Air has just over 400 nits of brightness, compared to 500 nits on the MacBook Pro, or 600 nits on the 2018 and the 2020 iPad Pros. Now, while this is still a very high number and one of the highest ones on any laptop out right now, as most laptops have around 350 nits of brightness, usually max, again, if you're into photo editing and you need a brighter display, or you just like working outdoors a lot, then a MacBook Pro is a better choice. But indoors, and in most cases, 400 nits is more than enough for me. I almost never even max out the brightness, by the way. And finally, the MacBook Air also features something called the True Tone Display. Essentially, if you enable this in the settings, the white point of the display will automatically match the light around you. So, just like a piece of paper, if the lights in your room turn yellow, the display will also turn that specific shade of yellow to match that light, making it very easy on the eyes for when you're reading or writing. Now, I do have to manually disable the setting every single time I want to edit a photo or a video, because I want to preserve the actual color accuracy. And yes, it does get a bit annoying doing that constantly and remembering to do that every time I want to work with color. So I just wish that Apple had True Tone, some sort of automatic True Tone that turns itself off when you open up Final Cut or Photoshop. So that was the display. Now, the third very important part for me in a laptop is the keyboard and the trackpad. And I am very glad to say that a keyboard has finally been improved. Or should I say completely replaced because this is what it essentially was. Gone is the troubled butterfly keyboard, which Apple introduced with a 12-inch MacBook in 2015, and then ported over to the MacBook Pros in 2016, and then to the MacBook Air in 2018. That keyboard was flawed from the very start, it had almost no key travel, so it was very difficult typing on it, and it also broke extremely easy. Apple ended up being sued multiple times, and yeah, you probably know the rest of the story already. And the really good news here is that we get the exact same keyboard as on the brand new 16-inch MacBook Pro. So this is a more standard scissor switch mechanism, very similar to what we had on that second generation MacBook Air from 2010. The only difference being that the keys are now even more stable and they feel even better to type on than on the second gen MacBook Air. In fact, this entire 12-page review video was fully scripted on my MacBook Air, and I even scripted a few other videos on it, the OnePlus 8 Pro experience, in case you missed that, you can watch it here, and about three to four more recent videos as well. And I gotta say, the typing experience on this MacBook Air is the best typing experience I've ever had on any laptop, even better than on that 16-inch MacBook Pro. And the reason for that is because the entire MacBook Air is much smaller than the 16-inch MacBook Pro, so you don't have this massive board of aluminum on which you're resting your palms on. Instead, you're typing on the entire laptop, if you know what I mean, or then typing on a keyboard that's inside a gigantic case, a gigantic laptop case. So it just feels so much more comfortable. Also, the fact that you have this teardrop slash taper design makes it so much more comfortable to type on, as not only is the keyboard angled when you type on it, but it doesn't feel as sharp and raised on your wrist as a MacBook Pro does. Oh, and the arrow keys are now back to being that inverted T-shape. Funny enough, the only thing that I miss about the keyboard from my 15-inch 2019 MacBook Pro is actually the touch bar. Yes, I do actually miss having it. I mostly used it in Word for changing some text presets or for quickly adjusting the volume or the brightness, so I wasn't using it a lot, but now that I don't have it anymore, I kind of do miss it. Luckily, we do have a fingerprint reader built into the power button, which is actually a bit recessed compared to the rest of the keys, but other than that, I really don't have any complaints. And the trackpad is outstanding as well. Trackpads on Macs have always been the best ones in the industry, and this one is no exception. So it is a bit smaller than on a 13-inch MacBook Pro, and way, way smaller than on a 15-inch or 16-inch MacBook Pro, but it's still larger than on most Windows laptops. It uses a haptic motor underneath it, so the trackpad itself doesn't actually click, but that haptic feedback gives you the impression that you actually pressed it, even though the glass itself doesn't move. Right, now onto the camera, microphones, and speakers. So the 2020 Air has the same camera as the 2018 model, which is a 720p camera, which is actually far inferior to the iPads or the iPhone's camera. Yes, I know that a screen is pretty thin, but Apple could have still added a 1080p camera in there. 
like the quality just isn't great. This is how it compares, by the way, to the Dell XPS 13 and 2 in 1. Then the microphones have also been improved as we now get a three mic array would be informing. Okay, so this is a camera and microphone test on the 2020 MacBook Air. Now, this is the 2019 15 inch, back to the MacBook Air. Now, this is the 2018 iPad Pro 11 inch, back to the MacBook Air. So this is how the MacBook Air sounds. And now this is the 2019 iPhone 11 Pro Max and back to the MacBook Air. Once again, MacBook Air, MacBook Pro 15 inch 2019, iPad Pro 11 inch 2018, and iPhone 11 Pro Max 2019. The speakers also got improved with a deeper bass as well as support for Dolby Atmos playback. OnePlus 8 and the OnePlus 8 Pro are finally here. In case you missed it, we've uploaded my live... And now, the fun part. So, we get to move to the performance section. Uh, this is where I have to say that aside from that keyboard change, this is where the other big changes really are. Like, first off, the 2020 MacBook Air is actually Apple's very first Mac to move onto Intel's new 10th generation processors. Well, new, they were actually released back in September 2019. Anyway, we get a 10th generation i3, i5, and i7 model. But don't get fooled, don't be fooled, this is not comparable in any way to a desktop class i3, i5, and i7, or even a MacBook Pro's 13-inch or 15-inch i3, i5, and i7. Like, these are all Intel's low-power Y-series processors, and in fact, these chips are basically the exact same processor, or the successor of the same processor found in the 12-inch MacBook from 2015, the Intel Core M, if you guys remember that. These are all some very low power 10 watt processors that don't require a fan. Now, the big changes here is that we do get four cores in a MacBook Air, like something that we only used to get in the 15 inch models um, and something that the 13 inch MacBook Pro only added in 2018. But if you do want to get the quad core CPU models, those are the i5 and the i7 and not the i3. The i3 is still dual core and this is the one that I have right here. So, which one is right for you, and should you pay extra for the i5 and i7 models? Well, I'll tell you straight away, don't buy the i7. Don't buy the i7 because the performance difference between the i5 and the i7 is almost nothing. So, you basically get the exact same experience for $150 less. So, the real question is, should you get the dual-core i3 model, or should you upgrade to that quad-core i5 model instead? Well, performance has actually been improved from the 2019 and the 2018 models, even on the base i3 model, and the single-core performance between the two is almost identical. In fact, the MacBook Air actually scores the highest in single-core performance compared to all the other Macs out there, yes, including the 16-inch MacBook Pro and including the Mac Pro, <laughs> fun fact. So, if you do a lot of single-core tasks, such as word processing, browsing the web on some websites, or even watching YouTube videos, you're better off with that dual-core i3 model, as the battery life would actually last you longer on that model. However, if you want to future-proof it, and maybe use it for a few more years, or you're just someone that's a bit more demanding in terms of what you do on a laptop, then I highly recommend getting the i5 model. As you not only get two extra cores for a much higher multi-core performance, but you also get a much more powerful GPU, as you get the G7 variant of the Iris Plus graphics, which is noticeably more powerful than the G4 variant that you get with the i3 model. The i7 also has the G7 GPU, in case you're wondering. Now, something that does directly affect the GPU performance is the amount of RAM. As Intel's integrated GPU actually uses part of the RAM as shared video memory, the more RAM you have, the more memory the GPU will also have, and the better the overall performance will be. So I highly, highly recommend upgrading to 16 gigabytes of RAM. Like mine only has eight gigabytes and my usage was pretty much maxing that eight gigabytes of RAM all the time, which meant that the system felt quite a bit sluggish most of the times, um, even when I was just scripting and I had just a few pages open in Safari. So 16 gigabytes of RAM is a must. The i5 upgrade over the i3 isn't a must, but I would suggest that as well if you plan on using this for more than three years. Oh, and the MacBook Air now has the fastest RAM that Apple has ever put in a MacBook. So this is now 3733 MHz RAM compared to the 2133 MHz RAM that we had in the 2019 model or 2666 MHz that a 16-inch MacBook Pro has. Okay, so now you're all probably wondering, 
how does the MacBook Air 2020 compare to the latest 13-inch MacBook Pro? As we do get what looks to be, well, a faster processor than the Pro, we also get a much better GPU, and we also get much faster RAM. Well, I'm sorry to break it for you, but the MacBook Pro 13-inch is still much more powerful than the Air is. And ironically, this has nothing to do with the components, which are actually more powerful on the Air and not the Pro. But because of cooling, that's, that's the reason. You see, the MacBook Air only has one single fan for cooling, whereas the MacBook Pro 13-inch can have even two fans if you go for the higher-end model with four Thunderbolt 3 ports. But that one fan on the Air isn't even connected to the CPU's heatsink. Instead, it just randomly sits in there in the case, as if it got disconnected and fell. And because of this, thermals on this laptop are pretty bad. So whenever you're doing something more intensive, such as video editing, the CPU gets as hot as 100 degrees on the air. <laughs> like, that fan doesn't seem to help at all. And the performance does take a pretty big hit. Like, it doesn't actually throttle, as the clocks will remain above the base 1.1 GHz clock speed on both the i3 and the i5 models. But it does get very close to that number whenever you're doing some very intensive tasks, or then staying at the turbo boost clock speeds of 3.2 or 3.5 GHz. And this is the only reason why the MacBook Pro 13-inch can actually outperform it. So why has Apple done such a thing? Why is Apple intentionally limiting the thermal performance of the Air? Is it so that you upgrade to that 13-inch MacBook Pro? Well, not necessarily. You see, the Y-series processor that's inside the MacBook Air is actually a fanless design, whereas the U-series processor that's inside a 13-inch MacBook Pro is not. As for Intel's own recommendations, the Air doesn't actually need a fan at all, whereas the MacBook Pro does. When Apple updated the Air in 2018 with a third generation design, they didn't even have to include a fan at all. Because remember, this is the same CPU design as the Intel Core M inside the 12-inch MacBook, which didn't even have a fan at all. But Apple decided to include a fan in the Air just for the sakes of longevity. And then when Intel added two more cores uh, inside its processor and therefore generating more heat, Apple decided to just stick with the same cooling as they had the year prior. So, if you plan on doing any photo or video editing, sure, the MacBook Air can easily handle those. Even 4K video editing for that matter. It's just that the export times would be much, much longer compared to a 13-inch MacBook Pro or not even to mention a 15-inch or a 16-inch model. So, if you do any photo or video editing on a daily basis, just don't buy the MacBook Air, get a MacBook Pro instead. But if it's just occasional photo and video editing that you do, then the MacBook Air can still handle that quite well. So, what about gaming? Well, first off, don't buy a Mac for gaming. And second, if you do buy a Mac for gaming, don't buy a MacBook Air for gaming. It's literally one of the worst options for gaming out of all Macs that Apple sells. Again, even if the GPU is far more powerful than on the 13-inch MacBook Pro, because of that fan not being connected to the heatsink, gaming performance is not great on the air. I mean, sure, you can play some very lightweight games such as Hearthstone, but when it comes to even Fortnite and most of the Steam games, which are actually 32-bit games and no longer supported, well, you're out of luck. Now, something that I do like a lot about the Air is that it comes with two Thunderbolt 3 ports. Now, Thunderbolt 3 is actually the fastest port on any consumer device out there right now, with speeds of up to 40 gigabits per second or 5 gigabytes per second. You can not only use this to connect to Thunderbolt 3 docks, which give you a ton of extra ports, by just using a single Thunderbolt 3 cable, left the link in the description box down below for a few very good ones, by the way, uh, but you can also use this to connect to a 5K monitor or two 4K monitors or even one 6K monitor. Yes, the MacBook Air does support Apple's own Pro Display XDR at full 6K resolution. Something that, ironically, not even the iMac Pro can do. Now, this is because the iMac Pro is using an older Thunderbolt 3 controller. And you can also use Thunderbolt to connect to an external GPU for some incredible GPU performance, which won't be throttled. Okay, so in this case you might be wondering, what's the gaming and the video editing performance on the MacBook Air when using a new GPU? Well, in Fortnite, for example, on native resolution and medium settings, the Air was averaging around 10 frames per second. However, with an eGPU attached, a Vega 64 in this case, we were getting around 60 frames per second on average, so yeah, that's a pretty big difference. In Final Cut Pro 10, for example, exporting or blind camera comparison took 1 hour and 15 minutes without an eGPU, and just 22 minutes with the Vega 64 eGPU attached. And this, by the way, was with the eGPU connected directly to the MacBook Air. So if you connect it to a monitor first and then to the Air, you would get an even higher performance. Okay, so now what about the actual battery life? Well, Apple, fun fact, actually dropped the battery life from 12 hours, which is what we had last year on the 2019 model, and 2018 to 11 hours. 
The battery is actually the exact same size as last year, so it's a 49.9 watts hour. So the increase in thickness is only due to the keyboard, which needed more space on the inside to travel. And then because the body got thicker, it also increased the weight. Now, in terms of how many of those 11 hours I actually got, I personally only got about five to seven hours. Seven hours at most. Now, my use case scenario was actually pretty light on the air. So I used it uh, mostly for scripting, researching. So I did have about 20 tabs open uh, all the time. I did a tiny bit of Photoshop work. And I also had Slack open, which consumes a lot of battery. And with this use case scenario, I was getting an average of around six hours. So in the end, is the MacBook Air 2020 worth it? Well, let's see. Compared to the 2019 model, we get a quad-core processor option, we get a better GPU, we get a much better keyboard. We also get 256 gigabytes of storage on the baseline model compared to 128, like we had before. So all of this for $100 less. Yes, the new MacBook Air actually starts from $1,000 or £1,000 in the UK. Now, this is indeed for the dual-core option and not the quad-core, uh, which is $100 more. But yeah, there you go. The MacBook Air was never a better deal than it is now. So for any casual user, I would highly, highly recommend it. For people that want something more powerful and something that's much better for photo and video editing, definitely consider the 13-inch MacBook Pro. But don't get one right now, because there will be a newer model with an updated keyboard coming out very, very soon. So hold off for that model instead. That 14-inch MacBook Pro that we've seen rumored, that's likely to be released by June. Now, if this is indeed the case, I might be considering upgrading or, you know, downgrading myself from my own 8-core 2019 15-inch model. If you want to get a MacBook Air, do consider using our affiliate links below as they don't cost you anything and you do help support the channel that way. So yeah, thank you for watching. This was, by the way, a massive video to make. It took like an entire full week in production. So if you want to see some more extremely in-depth tech reviews and videos like this one, definitely subscribe and enable notifications by tapping on that bell icon. And if you want to support us further, do consider becoming a member by using the button, the join button below. So yeah, thank you for watching. I'm Daniel, this is Enough Tech, and I'll see you guys in the next one. It's Enough Tech, signing out. Cheers.